Go ahead. All right. So, uh, I think we were on our first deployment. So, and then I was talking about what division I was in, and, and uh, uh, we had discussed uh, what is it, you know what the job was, and it was basically just being a final checker for the aircraft in our squadron uh, prior to and launching and recovery. So the flight ops consisted of sorties of numerous different aircraft from different squadrons that comprised of fighters, uh, bombers, uh, attack aircraft, uh, electronic warfare, uh, the support helicopters, and so on and so forth and the gas tankers that would go up to refuel the aircraft as they were uh, circling to go in formation to go on their sorties and such. So, And our job in each squadron was to make sure that all the birds that we had, we had 12 fighter, squad, uh, fighter uh, aircraft in our squadron, our sister squadron also had five, our 12, and then uh, uh, the other squadrons would have uh, 10 or 12 based on their... Uh, on their capabilities of what they were supposed to do in the air wing. So this was all. All these squadrons are in the same aircraft carrier. Then on they're Kennedy? on the same. Yeah, there's uh, the, there's different. Like I said, there's there's a couple of fighter squadrons. Uh, there's at least ninety aircraft that are on board the air, uh, the carrier at any given time, and that comprised of an air wing. So on my first tour. Uh, the air wing was CVW-1, which was the air wing out of the, uh, out of, uh, Norfolk. So, and most of the aircraft came from NAS Oceana, uh, which was in Virginia or, uh, surrounding areas that were close to that air base. So that Navy air base. So, but what I did was pretty much, uh, made sure that for that whole cruise, uh, I worked the flight deck, and we just made sure that all of our aircraft were capable of being launched uh, for the sorties that were required without having them to go down and send them back down to the shop for, or to hangar bay where they could be serviced and, and repaired. So we did, we did the final checking on that. So, so that was pretty much what I did the first cruise. And then the second cruise, uh, I... I retired down to uh, the shop where I became a maintenance uh, lead, uh, lead maintenance technician, and uh, and we repaired aircraft that would come back that had, um, you know, had suffered any kind of uh, issues. Uh, did a lot of of uh, seven day, fourteen day, thirty day, forty five day inspections, unlike what Boeing does <laughs> or, or the maintenance aircraft. Uh, a maintenance team does with the uh, commercial aircraft nowadays. But, but so every so many days you would have, uh, uh, I, like I said, I was a maintenance publication man, or I did the uh, the uh, petty officer publication. So, and that entailed going through and reading all the maintenance instruction manuals to making sure that they were up to date, uh, either removing or inserting uh, uh like from Bupers or from the, like McDonnell Douglas would send out something that would say, well, this is changed on, on this aircraft. You need to take this page out, put this page in, then you need to make sure everybody in the shop that has to deal with that portion of it, uh, which ours was the maintenance, the hydraulics, pneumatics, structural and corrosion control. Modifications. So we did all that. Yeah. And then, um, so that's uh, pretty much plus the fact that we would do, you know, the scheduled maintenance. We would do the unscheduled maintenance. We would do drop testing, all sorts of things while we're in the shop and uh, and all uh, while we're underway. So, so Cal, um, how, yes. often, how often do you go into port? Well, uh, like yep. this, would you go to different the, locations, like different well, countries? But, Yes, we would. So let's say uh, when we were in the second fleet, which was the Atlantic and the North Atlantic, uh, that's pretty much our transit to and from the sixth fleet, which was the Mediterranean. And so uh, uh, in our in our transit to the Mediterranean or into the where we would relieve an existing carrier to 
uh, of their duties that had been over there from anywhere from six to ten months. So we would uh, we would we would transit the Straits of Gibraltar between Morocco and Spain, and then uh, our first port would normally be uh, uh, like Rota, Spain. It wasn't really a port; it was just where we we would uh, check in. To the, uh, to the Mediterranean, and then we would sail in and probably port at Naples. Um, Do you ever get off the ship? Not, yeah, we, we would get, get liberty and stuff like that. So uh, so what was that like? Well, it was, Were you uh, wild was, sailors? or? Well, I, I did a lot of shore patrol when I got off, so because I had made rate, so as a third class, or a in E4, I could do petty, uh, you know, shore patrol. So I always like to chase and, and do shore patrol because uh, it gave you, I don't know, it sort of gave you uh, uh, an entry into different areas that the regular sailors couldn't go to because there's areas that were off limits. So no matter where we went, there was always areas off limits. And uh, especially when we're in, like in Turkey, uh, and, uh, and, you know, in the, in the, uh, Aegean Sea area, we, we had, uh, the sailors would be off limits. So we had to make sure that, uh, when we started stood shore patrol, we all stood it with their, their federal, uh, police force. And these, those guys always carried, uh, like Uzis and stuff like that. So we would, we would, uh, have a team of shore patrol go with, with their federal uh, uh, police force in certain areas. So not all the time, but in certain areas that were off limits. So in case we ran into any of our sailors, we had to get back to the ship. So, and that plus uh, we would take, uh, you know, if we were going to be ported for maybe a week, uh, the nice thing about Europe was they had a year rail system out there. So you could buy a pass and then you can go just about anywhere. You didn't have to have, I mean, other than your ID, you didn't have to have a, a passport or some kind of visa to go between countries. So, uh, especially like we ported in Genoa, Italy, or uh, in Cannes, or someplace like that, we could always take a train and go into Germany. Or I remember we were in Barcelona, and we went to the, Andor the, And uh, the Andorian Alps, which is kind of like, where the French and the Spanish mountains come together. It's like a big ski resort type of area. And so that was kind of neat. That was also what was neat. The, the town called Andorra, um, where Salvador Dali had this melted clock. <laughs> so that was kind of a neat thing to see. You know, there's all sorts of things that were, uh, were really interesting, especially like in Germany. Um, we'd, uh, we went up there in 72, uh, we, we, we left out of Genoa, Italy, and then we took the train up into Munich. And then I visited my brother who was at Swedish Kamon, which is an air, air army base. And so John was, uh, got leave and, uh, we went to a concert in, <laughs> in Munich or something like that. I think with these, uh, Country Joe and Fish and the remaining members of the doors after Jim Morrison passed away. So that was kind of a fun concert to go. Plus it was during Oktoberfest. So you could go to the Hopper house out there. And, uh, at the time, uh, the currency exchange was four mark to a dollar. So a quarter, uh, a mark was a quarter and you could get a liter of beer and a half a chicken for like four mark. So for a buck, you could drink and for cheap. chicken, yeah. And it was uh, it was an interesting tri trip. Uh, we got to go to the uh, one of the guys that I worked with in the shop had bought a brand new uh, BMW, and so we went to the BMW factory in Munich, and he was able to buy get his car, and then he got it shipped home from there. And then we went to Dachau, where they had the uh, the Jewish camp uh, concentration camp, and uh, and then Munich itself. What a beautiful city! It was all built on ruins from World War II. So, 
uh, that was kind of a neat thing. Then plus all the little, you know, uh, podunk towns in between that you would stop at to see uh, in between point A and point B. So there was a lot of interesting areas. Uh, Italy was interesting. The Amalfi Coast, uh, Greece was really interesting. Uh, so you joined the Navy a, to see the world and the world you saw. You virtually, you virtually did. You know, whenever you could port and you would get liberty, you could uh, you could get extended liberty if you were ported for, I think, at least five or six days. You can get an extended liberty if you had that time built up. So you would just take your leave. And then, uh, but like I said, the travel uh, was, was uninhibited. You could go anywhere as long as you had your ID behaved yourself. It wasn't like today where you had to have a special visa to go someplace or have a passport uh, in the military to, to get into another country. So, yeah. But, uh, and this is before the <clears throat> EU uh, consolidated and, and became, you know, one entity per se. So, so but, uh, when, you're, when you were on a ship, did guys get seasick? Uh, well, the carrier is like a city. I mean, there's, I mean, it, the Kennedy, I think, displaced over 60,000 tons of water. And uh, the flight deck was four and a half acres. It was like 90 feet off the water line. And, uh, you know, we, we would hit some really heavy seas and stuff like that, especially up in the North Atlantic above the Arctic Circle. And uh, we're... You know the ship would pitch, and and when the when the bow broke, you know it would pitch probably thirty or forty feet. So and when the bow broke, uh, any waves because you would always go into the waves. You wouldn't go with the trop. You'd go into the trop, and uh, or always into the wind per se, I guess. But uh, they would have waves that would crash over the top of the of the flight deck and. It's interesting, you know. I, I could be up there. We did some watches during our time above the North or above the Arctic Circle, and it was so windy. We had there was four of us tied together, so we were we had a lanyard that would tie us from uh, about every fifty feet. Uh, they had uh, repelling hooks where you could hook onto your belt. <laughs> the belts were cheap anyway, but and then they would tie you to. Um, uh, some stable, like an aircraft or something like that, and then you would be able to, we'll see you later. And so um, you would uh, you would go through and you would check in your, in your area of the flight deck, you would check to make sure all the planes were tied down. Uh, and each one had like uh, different tie down situations where they would put nine to 12 to 13 chains to tie you down to pad eyes. It, which are depressions in the in the uh, flight deck, and then you would tighten these chains down, uh, and then you would go check them to make sure that they weren't loose so the aircraft couldn't take off or break a chain or something of that nature. So, but what I was getting at was that it was so windy that we're on the bow. There's a, a friend of mine and I were on the bow of the ship about 50 feet apart, and you could jump up in the air, and it would blow you backwards. It was that windy. It was like 40, 50 mile an hour winds coming across the bow. So, but the uh, as far as getting sick, we always had a complement of support ships that came by and stayed with us. So there was always a few cruisers, a, uh, at least a couple destroyers, and then underwater there was always uh, uh, submarines. So it was a fairly large uh, detachment. You know, the carrier had maybe 13 or 14 support ships with it at any given time. Not that you could see them, but every once in a while there would be like a, uh, uh, as, you know, the carrier is so huge. So every once in a while you would see like a little destroyer uh, come alongside so it could keep, get out of the wind. And these things would just roll from side to side. So they would list the port, list to the starboard, list back forth. And the conning towers on these things would kiss the water. So, and I oh. knew a couple of guys that were on destroyers that were on these cans. And uh, we stopped in Edinburgh and I, 
I, there was a couple of destroyers that had uh, ported with us. And I was talking to one of them and said, yeah, we live with our, our trash cans, so they get sick pretty easy. But on a carrier, not so much, yeah. I think uh, yeah, I don't ever remember having any kind of queasiness on a carrier. So, so is yours nuclear? No, we were the last conventional carrier. Kennedy, they laid uh, they laid the hull on that one. We were the last conventional carrier made, uh, and that was uh, CVA sixty seven. Yeah. So that's a diesel. It, it was uh, it was electric. Uh, and yeah, it was run by diesel or jet fuel is what it was. They used JP on that. So that thing could move probably 30, 30 knots plus. It was, it was a massive, uh, massive, uh, massive ship. It was pretty good Moving size. Right along. Yeah. So it would go, I mean, you could water ski behind it. <laughs> And uh, when it was moving, you know, you'd go to the fantail and you'd look down, and it had four big screws on it. They were like, I would say they're probably maybe, from what I understood, they're probably 30 feet in, in diameter from blade to blade. And so they had four screws, two aft and two a little bit forward. And that's the propellers, and, right? And, yeah. And, and when they, especially in heavy seas, you go to the fantail and you'd watch, and you it, it would come out, you know, when it was... When it would uh, it would pitch, the the bow would go in and the fan tail would come up. It, it was really amazing. It was totally amazing to see these things. And then when they when they broke the water surface, then you could see them turn. And it a, but you know they had such a big pitch on the screw blade that uh, the revolutions just pushed this thing along like it was going on a sail, just like a speedboat. So, so Cal, you know, did did you have any close calls while you're in? On the Kennedy? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's there's a few that I had. Well, not a few. I, if you had your head on a swivel, you were in good shape. The, they all said that the average lifespan of working on the flight deck was about 90 seconds if you didn't have your shit together. And uh, there, I, yeah, there's 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 a guy I knew that. You know, I knew a couple of guys up there that, that not from our squadron, but, you know, you have a camaraderie with, with everybody that works up there, whether it's ship's company or, I mean, all these people that work together. You know, got your flight deck uh, directors, uh, you got your launching directors, you got, uh, you got your, uh, your grapes, which are guys in the purple shirts that would fuel the aircraft, and you have the blue shirts, and you have the... I mean, each one of us was designated by a color. You know, the the plane captains were all in, in brown, and uh, the troubleshooters, we had white. Uh, the corpsmen had white with, with crosses, and and uh, the, the, the guys that, the boatswain's mates, aviation boatswain's mates, which were a ship's company, they were all in yellow. And so what they would do is direct traffic up there with these aircraft, and, and it's... You know, each one of these these uh, aircraft had different, you know, attributes to them. You know, like the A7s were pitched maybe 15 degrees from nose to tail. And so their jet blast was always directed in a downward fashion. The F4s were were just, you know, straight across horizontal. And, you know, like the... the uh, they had uh, helicopters going. They had E-2Bs, which were propeller-driven uh, electronic warfare aircraft. Those were the most dangerous. And uh, they usually parked those against the island, um, which is the the superstructure that sticks above the flight deck was the mm -hmm. called the island, and that had had the uh, Airbus up there. It had the uh, where they had navigation and so on and so forth. So, and plus they had a place that called the crow's nest, which is like a long balcony, maybe about 40 or 50 feet long, where you could go up and, and observe flight operations uh, if you if you wanted to. But uh, the E-2Bs were propeller driven. They were really dangerous. And then you had crash crew up there. These guys were, you know, in, 
in their flame suits and stuff like that. I mean, it was just an orchestrated, a highly orchestrated group of people on the flight deck. And, and uh, you know, we had six, 90 aircraft, but, you know, sometimes there would be uh, maybe 30 downstairs in the hangar and then 60 on board, and you would launch and recover uh, every 45 minutes. So you're launching aircraft uh, off of four catapult systems, two on the bow and two on the waist, and those are uh, steam-driven uh, with a water break on them. So they would take a 50, 60,000-pound aircraft and then 150 feet, get it going 170, 180 knots. So, uh, plus, you know, feet supported by the aircraft's so own propulsion. You better have system. a headrest, huh? <laughs> so, we, <clears throat> the, say, we, Cal. we had some accidents. Yeah, there was accidents. Yeah. Uh, these planes were being launched. Were they going somewhere? Were they on a mission? Yeah, were there they was, bombing there was, or strafing or? Well, you have to realize the military is is a, nothing but a big training organization. So I mean, well, you know, it's when you do something, you know, you you're uh, you continually train, and uh, we trained uh, with multiple different countries. We trained with the people from Norway, the Netherlands, uh, from Germany, from the UK. Um, uh, we trained with uh, the Turks. Uh, I mean, anybody that was part of the NATO organization we trained with. So uh, we had one, I think in 73, um, we I can't think of the name. I think it was called, yeah, in 73, we did a training uh, called Swift Move, and it was up in the North Atlantic. And uh, we trained, uh, there was, I believe, at least 20,000 troops involved in that. I mean, men, women, whoever, back then, you know, back in the 70s. And, uh, but we trained with, with just all sorts of different uh, military uh uh, entities from different countries, and we cross-decked. Uh, I we we were with the the UK had a carrier called the Ark Royal, and they had the F four. We had the F four Bs and F four C birds, which were uh, you know each military had a different type of F four in the fighter category. We call them Phantoms. Yeah, they were all Phantoms. That was just in the fighter. I mean, I'm just talking what we had that I'm only right. familiar with. And so the the English had the F4K, which had Rolls Royce engines in it. It was it was a it was a brutal aircraft. And they also had one called a Buccaneer. And so we cross decked uh, to the Ark Royal. Uh, the other troubleshooter, uh, Victor Sedola, he went to the Ark Royal with our aircraft, and I stayed uh, on the Kennedy. And then uh, their their crew came over with their aircraft, and so we were launching their aircraft off our carrier. So it, it was it was really interesting. And then plus the, the English were they're a funny lot, <laughs> but they were uh, they were an interesting crew to work with. So and the Dutch were another ones that were uh, that were relative uh, was interesting to work with. And each one of these different countries. It, they were obligated to, to serve in their military. So, uh, but they had some, you know, like the Dutch, I think they had to spend, from what I can remember, I'm just trying to grab what I was remembering from talking with them, is that they were obligated to do five or six years. Oh, really? Yeah. But, you know, they're, they you weren't know as regimented as the, as the, uh, the military was uh, in in uh, you know our U.S. military that I can remember. They uh, they were lax on. They had really nice uniforms and they had a. Their uh, their uh, they were a little bit more lax on their uh, like hair and stuff like that. Uh, they they could have the beard. We could too because under uh, the CNO at the time was Al, uh, Elmo Zumwalt. And so he said, I'm going to modernize the Navy. And he was instrumental in bringing in 
uh, women into the into the Navy, and then eventually after his, you know, he was out of the service uh, after he retired, it continued on that way so that you could have co-ed ship uh, board activities and stuff like that. So, but you couldn't have a full beard, could you? I had a beard, yeah. I had a beard, long hair. In fact, uh, in the uh, Navy, a couple of my <laughs> in some of my evaluation reports, you know, our division officer would say. The hair is a little long or something like that, but all neatly groomed. You know, I was all spit shine. But they wouldn't I, let I, you have a beard because of gas mask, would they? Well, uh, we didn't have to worry about that. Uh, ship company, uh, maybe they couldn't and stuff like that. So, But on, on the flight deck, you know, like I said, I had a beard and uh, uh, sort of long hair. You know, as long as it was neat... They, they didn't really care. It was up to the uh, the commanding officer and the division officers that you worked underneath of your squadron and such. Okay. But there was a standard set that was set by Ab- Albo Zumo. And so he wanted to modernize the, the, the Navy. And then from there, I think it took off a rumor. So it wasn't like being in the Marines where you were, where you were trim, you know, you know, had it clean up to the, to the top. So, but, um, so you never made it into the, like the South China Sea, anything like that? No, uh, actually, in January of 73, we were getting ready. We were doing carrier falls because we're going to Southeast Asia. So the Kennedy was in, in the in this carrier air wing that was associated with was uh, ready to go. And so we did all our carrier for qualifications. We were uh, ready to head south and do the, uh, do the equator. And I think it was February. Uh, I can't remember. Was it February when they had the Paris Peace Accords? February, March of that year, uh, the Paris Peace Accords uh, had the they did the ceasefire, and uh, and so we were pulled and yanked off of that, and. Uh, I think that year, when the heck was that? Oh, yeah, it was January that it was, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the beginning of the year that we were ready to go. And then the peace accords came in uh, February, or March, something like that. But then we took off and went, uh, we did some more sea, um, uh, uh, some uh, operational readiness um, type of activities and stuff like that and then in april we went back overseas so we went to the we went to the second fleet and then we went into the sixth fleet and then uh that was the year we had the uh we went to the north atlantic came back out because we were ready to after about five or six months in the in the mediterranean we did the uh the uh the uh, swift move thing up in the north atlantic in the arctic circle and then as we left Edinburgh, we were ready to go back to Norfolk. And that was in October. Like, it was actually October 6th. It was the beginning of Yom Kippur. And that's when the uh, Syrians and the Egyptians invaded Israel. And so we had to stand uh, watch off the Straits of Gibraltar on the Atlantic side. We are still in the second fleet. And... Uh, the I think around the 13th or 14th of August, October uh, we got called into the Med and so we spent then we rejoined the 6th Fleet that's the second uh, it's actually I think the first time a carrier's ever had to do two tours of duty so so how many so we times went into the, how many times you, you end know, up in, back in Norfolk well I spent out of this three years, 11 months, and I think 20 days in the Navy, <laughs> I did three years in one month at sea. Wow. So our squadron just loved to fly. And, uh, and we, we would go back and forth, you know, but our beach time was limited based on the carrier's ability to be ready to go at any given moment. So. You know, and the carrier had to go go in for cold iron every once in a while, where they would take it in and and do some refurbishing and stuff like that. Uh, 
over a 60 to 90 day period. So that equated to some beach time or temporary duty. Uh, some of our temporary duty was in Guantanamo Bay. So did you have an uh, apartment some of, or something? Well, we lived in the barracks. In the barracks? Yeah. 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 The, um, the, uh, in, when I was in school in, in Memphis, the barracks were like, like you see in, in the movies and stuff like that, where you had, you had cubicles that were open air and then you had racks in each of those cubicles. And the only thing that separated uh, the cubicle from the other was like a wall locker that was in place. So, so you're, you're, that's the way we that's the way that was in school in, in, uh, when I was stationed on the beach in Oceana with the squadrons that I was with, they had four man rooms. And so, and then you had a common bathroom down the hallway and, and an area where you could sit and, and recreate and that type of stuff. So those barracks were more, they were like a college dormitory type of thing per se. Um, and, uh, but when we did TDYs, uh, like Guantanamo Bay, they were kind of like a... What's that mean, a, TDY? A, uh, temporary duty. So we'd have to do... It was, everything was done through readiness, so especially with the fighter squadrons. The fighter squadrons were set up for Alert 5 situations, and the, the <laughs> Russians would fly uh, from their bases out of the north... You know, up by Norway and stuff, they would have an air base up there. So they had these aircraft called Badgers and Bears. So they would fly these long distance bombers. Uh, one was a, I think, uh, one was a prop driven, and the other one was a, was jet propulsed. And they would fly down the Atlantic uh, off the coast of the uh, eastern coast of the United States, and they would fly to Cuba. And so we would have to go. We would be in Key West or in uh, in Jacksonville or Mayport, Florida, and uh, we would fly Alert Five mission. So, an Alert Five is is that if there's a Russian in our airspace or close to our airspace, we would launch an aircraft uh, and be ready to launch within five minutes. Is what they, that's why they call it the Alert Five. Launch the Alert Five. And so we would do that at sea on the carrier, or we do that as a temporary duty in like Key West, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the weird thing about Gitmo was Gitmo was on the south side of Cuba, and so we would have to come in and fly. <laughs> they couldn't fly over land to get to the Alert Five. They would have to fly around either the eastern or western coast, and then go back up, and because uh, you couldn't fly in Cuban airspace. So Gitmo was kind of a unique situation. Uh, it was a neat place to be, though. Okay. Uh, yeah, it uh, it uh, they had a beach. Well, the base in Gitmo was kind of like in a little channel area, and it had concertina wire and chain link all around it. And on one side, you had the Russian-supported Cubans patrolling with their tanks and stuff like that and their little roads back and forth. And the other side you had like where they recreated, uh, there's like little beaches there, out there so you could sit there on the beach and the Cubans would be on one side and you'd be on the other side. That was kind of a different thing. And But you know, I never thought anything about it being uh, ominous. It was just they're doing their thing and we're doing our thing. And uh, you know how we were brought up to never trust the Russians and all this other stuff when we were growing up and uh, and communism and stuff. It kind of took a different approach when I was in the service. I didn't really feel that animosity towards that. You never, you never felt threatened. Yeah. So, I mean, there was a cat and mouse game. I think everything we did in the service was based on that. But I, I truly believe that, you know, if people knew what we had in the service back in the 70s, if people really knew, the civilian populace really knew what we had as far as armament and stuff like that, it was just amazing. 
you know, we had aircraft that could fly at 40 some thousand feet in the air, take a picture of a pack of cigarettes on the, t- on the flight deck and you could read it, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, so we had really good intelligence and really good, uh, uh, really good tactical gear and stuff like that, I think. So, and it's even gotten better since then. So, hmm. but, uh, as, as far as having any, any kind of, uh, ill feelings towards anybody, you know, I just didn't have it. I, I don't think we had that type of attitude. We just were there to do a job. And we focused on our job, and uh, and uh, which was ultimately to protect uh, our our constitutional right to, to be free and stuff in the United States. So. You never ever really felt threatened, so it was mostly training, support. Well, except for Yom Kipper, we were flying yeah. real. You know, we we're flying. You know, there were real ops involved in that. So. But I mean, it was just like a regular day. I mean, that's, you know, we didn't know what they were doing out there. <laughs> so, I mean, the pilots, we, uh, the, we made sure the pilots had an aircraft they could get into. They knew that they were going to be able to come back in. And, and if it got broke, we would fix it. And uh, we actually won the CNO Safety Award four years in a row. So uh, no accidents or anything in our aircraft, which was quite an accomplishment says a lot about you guys well it says a lot about the each division you know the the ordnance division never had a mishap where they had a bomb explode on them or the or the aes uh did all the electronics and stuff like that the uh the support of the the guys that did the martin baker ejection seats uh the jet mechanics that uh, made sure the engines were always ready to go and and the airframes you know we uh I really liked air frames. It was one of those things that that really struck me as something that I could do well. Uh, I had good grades in the in the testing on that, and we actually had an aircraft in one of our uh, <clears throat> that came back and did a hard landing and broke a main spar, and so uh, it was a naval air reef work facility type of job. <laughs> And they uh, they tasked that to a guy named Bob Johnson. I think his I can't think of his last name. Bob somebody. And I were working nights, uh, so we had the night crew, and so we put it up on a jack stand, tore it apart, and rebuilt the darn thing. And uh, it didn't. It wasn't a hangar queen for more than about a, a week, and uh, which was kind of a remarkable deal. So we reworld the MIMS manual on how to repair stuff. Uh, at sea, which was kind of a neat thing. So, but uh, then you get an accommodation for that. That seventy-five cents got me a cup of coffee when I got home. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's all about what you feel inside your accomplishments. And I think uh, I've always stressed to anybody that hasn't hasn't got a purpose in life. I said, well, you know, you should check and see what the military can do for you because. If it doesn't give you what you want, it can lead you to some place uh, down the road. And I think what it did for me was it uh, it gave me uh, like a can-do attitude and gave me some pride. I always did something where I never had to worry about uh, having to redo it because if you can't do it right the first time, it's not worth doing. So, and that's the way my I've been my whole life. Of course, that's my dad's upbringing too. You know, he said, you know, just do it right the first time. So, and then I worked for a bunch of people in Warren uh, when I was growing up. You know, before I could drive, they had the same attitude. You know, this is what you did and how you did it, and uh, <laughs> you don't need to go back and redo it type of thing. So that was, uh, and all these guys I worked for were veterans from World War Two. So I don't know. It was just. I think that's just a small town, uh, the way the small town attitude is. Well, you know, aren't you from Argyle yes. originally? Yes. Yeah. So, right. yeah, I mean, that's the way we were raised. So, where, where did you muster out at, Cal? Um, well, anyway, in 74, um, 
VF-32, uh, my original squad, squadron, was was retiring all the F-4s. So, and the F-4 had been around since uh, the 60s. So, uh, so we were the first squadron to retire the F-4 to go to the F-14 Tomcat, the one that they see in Tom Cruise movies and stuff. And so the F-14 Tomcat was... Uh, the training for it was in Miramar, California. So I had seven or eight months left. I was a short timer. Uh, I would have had to re-enlist in order to go out and work on the F-14s, which I, I just got married in February. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. So, and, uh, so I got transferred with a bunch of short timers to VF-103, which was still an F-4 squadron. And then uh, transferred from, uh, they were still in Oceana, but we transferred from the JFK to the uh, Saratoga and the America. So, uh, which were two other carriers. The Saratoga was in the 60s and the America was this, was the ship just before the Kennedy, 66. So, <laughs> and they were based out of, uh, Saratoga was based out of, Norfolk and America was based out of Mayport, Florida. So I did temporary duty in Mayport, Florida, and then some more Gitmo time, and then uh, I think in gosh I can't remember when we left. Um, I think in September. No, that's hard. I can't remember. We we left. Norfolk, I got out in November of 74, so we left, I think, in September and went overseas, and I, we, we went through the Straits of Gibraltar in October, September or October of 74, and uh, we were in Naples, Italy in November, and I got my, my uh, muster out paper, so I hopped a, a transport out of Naples, Went to Rota, Spain, caught a commercial charter uh, that was set up by the military, <laughs> and we flew back to McGuire Air Force Base, uh, I think on, it was either, yeah, it was 11, November 11th or something, yeah. And then from there, I went to Philadelphia and mustered out on the 13th. Okay. And, then, and, yeah, and what did it. you do after yeah. after the Navy? Um, I worked for my father-in-law uh, for about six months, and then I went to school. And Where was that at? Uh, in Angus. Okay. <laughs> so you married a local girl? Yeah, I married a local girl. I dated her in high school, and then uh, uh, we got married. We got, it was too young, but so we got divorced in uh 79 i think it was so we were married in 74 divorced in 79 but um the went to school at Moorhead state university and uh i wanted to be an art teacher for some reason i don't know why i tried to get an early out to be an architect but that didn't work so schooling wasn't for me and so i got a job working construction, which I had been doing all my life prior to going in the service, and uh, with a uh, company out of Wapton, North Dakota, who was doing a lot of FHA-type housing in uh, West Fargo. Mm -hmm. And so I worked for them uh, for a couple of years. You see, 75, 76, and, yeah, for at least three years. And... Uh, we built houses in Grand Forks and out by uh, uh, by Columbia area where the the mall is across from Interstate 29. And in fact, we were back from my mom's memorial in 21, and uh, they were still standing. It was God. There's I'm surprised. It was one of the first panelized housing. Uh, contractors in the area so they built everything inside of a you know they panelized the walls and stuff inside a factory uh or a warehouse inside of in Wapiton 
then they would ship them out and then we would build the foundations and the the first floor and then we would stand these walls and then frame them all in and stuff like that so they made single and two-story homes so that's what i did and then after my divorce i moved out to uh, montana and worked on coal at coal strip so, we're at montana uh, Coal Strip, Montana, which was off the Cheyenne Reservation. Uh, and it was a company-owned town, Morrison Knudsen type of thing. And we built uh, foundations and swung Boise Cascade homes on for the Cheyenne Indians on the reservation. So that's what we did. So I did that for about a year. And then the guy I was working for was going through a divorce. <clears throat> and he... Uh, he sort of dropped the ball on a couple of homes, and the uh, and the uh, clients said, "You guys want to finish it up for us?" And so this guy I I was out in Montana with, we put together a company, got it, uh, uh, got a documented company, and we and then we started building custom homes in uh, Montana, in Hardin, in uh, which is on the Crow Indian Reservation, or just off of that. So, and then that. That until uh, I moved out to Colorado and met my pre my current wife, and we got married. And the rest is history. So, and you're in LA now, or you're in California? Yeah, right? I, we we moved uh, out here in '86, and uh, uh, her her mother and father live in Torrance, which is where we live now. But so we. Uh, we moved out here and I went to work. I was going to take some time off and went to work for a custom builder up in Beverly Hills and, uh, and worked for him for 12, 13 years, something like that. And we built in Bel Air and, uh, in Encino and, you know, a lot of high price areas, a lot of really high price homes. And it was a uh, real interesting. Then, uh, uh, he kind of got like, greedy and I so I left him and went to work for another company which I retired from for 22 years was uh, we built affordable housing for veterans cool. so I did that for 22 years and uh, I was a uh, 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 back in 93 remember they had the McKinney Act where they were, they were uh, shutting down bases and turning them over to the different municipalities that the bases were at Sure. So, uh, Long Beach had the Long Beach uh, Naval Shipyard there, and uh, which was really a massive shipyard for for uh, the uh, U.S. fleet. And they had a uh, on the Terminal Island area. They had a married uh, <coughs> married housing, and uh, that when that went well when those. The city received that. They received a buttload of land from the Navy that was deeded back to them, and along that with all the housing and stuff and building stuff on it. So, but you know, when you don't live someplace and you don't exercise it every day, it goes to hell in a handbasket pretty fast. So I, uh, I was a uh, uh, project superintendent on rebuilding these so that they could be transported into a fourplex into housing 23 uh, veterans. And it was a fairly large base. So we did that for two or three years. And uh, uh, we got out of, well, I got out of that part of it, but stayed with the company. They needed to have a, uh, an engineer that would go through all the different sites. And, uh, and I was kind of qualified for that. Uh, we had a facility in Arizona. We had another facility in Las Vegas, one in Houston, Texas, and one in uh, uh, Barbers Point, Hawaii. And so each one of those, we we basically took what was there and then expanded upon it so that we could provide more housing stuff. So there was a lot of construction based on that and then uh, facility management afterwards. Okay. So it was interesting. I, I really enjoyed it, and I retired in twenty in twenty two. Yeah. So twenty twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so just lately. So, yeah, so I've only been read. Uh, well, you know, COVID hit. There's uh, all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, I was getting a little disillusioned with with uh, these. We have to realize that there's so many homeless veterans out there that have problems. So, and and this is even goes through the VA and stuff like that. So, but the the issue is is that you know you can give somebody a a place to live, but if you don't treat what's going on with them, they're going to end up back on the street, or they're not going to get through their their issues and stuff. So, so when we started to when I started working for this company, they had, they had a, um, you know, we were providing housing, but they also had a nonprofit that was tied in with it, which is called uh, United States Veterans Initiative. And you can look that up. It's usvets.org. And what they did at the very beginning was, is that they had this veterans in progress uh, program where in order to, to become you know, where you could live in their facility, you had to go through like a 90 day program to manage what, you know, you're, you're dealing with economics or with drugs or with, you know, anything. And then you got that out of your system and then they would allow you to move into transitional housing. And, and from there you could move into permanent housing and which we provided, we provided the housing portion of it, but we were, we were partners in that sense only. We weren't part of that group, a nonprofit, and they weren't part of our group. So we were a for-profit; they were non-profit. So there was there was uh, there was never any monkey business type of thing. So there's always a separation, way beyond arm's length. So uh, and so what happened was is that that policy worked really well. So let's fix your problems and then work on your problems, and you can continue living with us. Uh, at a fair market rent and uh, and get the services that you need and so on and so forth. Then when homelessness exploded in the, uh, in the, uh, I would say in the like 2015, 2016 area, it started to become, let's give them housing first. So all these cities and stuff out here, and, and, and that's not only for the civilian population, but for the, the, the homeless veteran population. So they said, let's go housing first. Well, we don't care about their problems. So they would come into these transitional units or permanent units, fair market rent, you know, they would be qualified for that. And they would bring all their problems with them. So we have guys that are sober, living in these, in these places, beautiful. I mean, million dollar, millions, millions of dollars we put into these, these really nice places and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, some of these, if I ever became homeless, I'd like to live there. So, but they were, they were like uh, an apartment and uh, they had their own bathrooms, they had their own kitchens, they had their own uh, living, sleeping area, kind of like a, like a hotel room type of thing. And you had your amenities and so on and so on. But you would bring these non-functioning homeless veterans in and put them along with the functioning homeless veterans that were trying to get back to their get back into the mainstream and be responsible tax paying citizens and they would just it was just it was crazy. So you know, you get government involved in something, it screws it up all the time. So that's my rant. I'm sorry. Now, Cal, did you want to uh, anything you want to add to your military career? Well I wish now I would have made a career out of it. And uh, it, uh, it went, I, at the time, I think, Keith, that uh, when I was getting out, I was, I was, it was, a, you know, I, don't get me wrong, I was always sharply dressed. I always pertained, uh, paid particular attention to how, I was supposed to act as far as UMJ, you know, the United, uh, Uniform Military uh, Code was. Uh, I obeyed orders. Um, oh, I guess I could interject one thing. When I was dating a girl up in Warren, Pennsylvania, I was unauthorized absence. 
so I had a captain's mast. <laughs> but uh, I, I worked that off. So, but uh, see what love does to you. So, and uh, but it gave me some something to it, it gave me uh, some some solid uh, structure in my life. So, and and looking back uh, at the time, I was fed up with with all that. I, I, I said, well, you know, I'll do what I have to do in order to do it correctly. And because there's everybody's life is involved in it. And we're part of the main, we're part of a team. And so I didn't uh, deviate from that part of it, but then I didn't care for the, I guess the political part of it. And it did get to be kind of politicized, uh, towards the end there in, in, in the seventies. So, uh, I, I thought I could do better in the civilian part of it, but after looking back, it kind of turned itself around in the uh, in the nineties, and I would have been out by now then. So I would have had my career done and probably a full pay and all this other stuff for retirement. Plus, had the opportunity to do what I'm doing now, and you know, because uh, I had plenty of time to do what I'm doing now. So um, it just it's I I think. I, as far as I'm concerned, it was the best possible avenue for me to take leaving Warren and doing what I did military-wise. It gave me a sense of belonging. It gave me a sense of, of uh, not putting myself first, but putting the team first. And I don't know. I mean, we're a great big group. We're out there, and uh, I still converse social media wise with guys that I 50 some years ago it's just like yesterday so and you know we don't talk about military stuff but we talk about what we're doing in our life and stuff but every once in a while it goes back to oh remember this day you know that type of thing so but yeah there's I don't know it's just the military was for me it's not for everybody but I believe me I think you give it a chance uh it, it may surprise me, so. Okay. Cal, uh, I want to thank you for doing this interview. Well, and, I appreciate it. And I want Thanks to thank you for your service. Me. Well, thank you. Okay, Cal. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. I you mean, too, Cal. Uh, Don Leslie, uh, he loves the hell out of you, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, but I, I really appreciate it. So how does this work now, Keith? What happens? So. Here, I'll take us off here.